Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome uh, again to Samaritan's Purse International Health Forum. Uh, it's been raining torrentially here in Boone for the last three days, and we're uh, delighted to finally see some sunshine. Delighted to have you with us today. Uh, excited for another presentation. Just as always, want to remind you, there's a chat box to the right there. If you could sign in, just putting your name and uh, where you're um, listening from today, that would be appreciated. And then at the end, if you could just uh, direct your questions uh, to us, uh, we'd love to spend about 10 uh, minutes in Q&A at the end of this uh, session. Um, as always, I'd like to start us off in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this uh, beautiful uh, day here in Boone. And uh, thank you uh, just for Samaritan's Purse International Health Forum, Lord, that we're able just to learn more uh, so that we can utilize medicine as a tool for the sake of the gospel. We're delighted to have Dr. Sund here today. And I just pray you bless him as he speaks to us today about anesthesia. We just thank you uh, mostly for your son, Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Uh, well, I'm delighted uh, today to present to you Dr. Greg Sund. I just uh, actually, uh, not just a couple weeks ago, spent some time with him at uh, Kabuye Hospital where he practices in Burundi. We had our first uh, orthopedic surgical subspecialty campaign where he served as our anesthesiologist and just did a phenomenal, remarkable job. Uh, Dr. Sund is uh, an American board certified anesthesiologist with subspecialty training in cardiothoracic anesthesia and uh, he is currently working under the auspices of Surge, again, at Kabuye Hospital there in rural Burundi uh, in East Africa. Uh, Greg serves with his family there. His wife, Stephanie, is a lactation uh, uh, consultant, and he has three children, Ella, uh, Piper, and Benyam. And uh, Greg serves as the chief of uh, reanimation at Kabuye, and uh, he also is a professor of anesthesia and reanimation of uh, Hope Africa University, which is based in the, uh, the capital of Burundi. Uh, Greg is um, very passionate about teaching uh, and uh, discipling African physicians and anesthesiologists. And I can just say, having spent time with him, he's a remarkable clinician anesthesiologist, and uh, he does what he does for the sake of the gospel. Delighted to have Dr. Sund with us today as he presents Pearl and Pitfalls to Practicing Anesthesia in a Resource-Poor uh, Environment. Uh, so, Dr. Sund, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Lance. Uh, so, when Lance first uh, invited me to present uh, this topic, uh, Pearls and Pitfalls to Practicing Anesthesia, uh, the first uh, thought that kept coming into my mind as, uh, as I was thinking about what to share uh, was this next slide? So many pitfalls, so few pearls. So while I hope to share a few pearls with you today, uh, I am uh, probably going to share several pitfalls to which I have not yet found a pearl. Um, if anyone out there has pearls to share with me, uh, I would be very happy for you to contact me. They tell me I'm still mildly teachable. Uh, next slide. So this is my favorite family. It's my family. Uh, we have been serving with the team in Kabuye since 2014, and our sending agency is Surge, formerly World Harvest Mission. Next slide. So we work in Kabuye, Burundi. Uh, it's a really beautiful country of about 11 million people, uh, about 75% of whom uh, live below the national poverty line. Uh, over 50% of kids under five are chronically malnourished, um, and we work at a rural mission hospital about three hours from the capital city, Bujumbura. Uh, we're affiliated with Hope Africa University. Um, and uh, the picture on the right is, uh, is my colleague, Dr. Fader, doing surgery, surrounded by an ocean of medical students who are, are always present. Uh, and so we do uh, really try to focus our efforts on teaching and training and discipling medical students, anesthetist students, and we're soon hoping to start residency programs in general surgery and family practice. Next slide. So um, this is uh, from a website called World Mapper. Um, and if you've uh, never visited this website, uh, it's fun. It has different maps of the world with countries inflated or deflated, depending on different statistics, de different demographic data. Um, and so this one is actually uh, shows the number of physician anesthesia providers uh, working in each country. Uh, 
And uh, if you look, uh, if you can bring your eyes to Africa, uh, you'll see a big green blob at the bottom, which is South Africa. Um, you'll see a few moderately sized green countries at the top, which are Northern Africa. Um, but most of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is uh, almost invisible, really. And so I think this shows uh, the massive need to increase the anesthesia workforce in many countries, but especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. Next slide. So I wasn't quite sure who my audience would be for this uh, presentation. And so I wanted to have something for uh, the anesthesia provider or practitioner. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the different types of anesthesia available to us, uh, risks, benefits, pearls, pitfalls. I'll probably spend most of my time doing that. But I also wanted to provide something for the person who works with anesthesia providers, but does not necessarily practice anesthesia. And finally, something for the person who has nothing to do with anesthesia. And for that, I'm gonna talk about pain management. Next slide. So this has become my new tagline. Um, in recent years, there's been a lot of talk about improving access to safe surgery. Um, but I, I want us all to keep in mind that safe surgery is not, in fact, safe surgery without safe anesthesia. And I've heard a lot of stories uh, since I've started working in Africa of surgeons who are either forced to provide their own anesthesia or to work with anesthetists who are underqualified. And the results can really be devastating for the patients. Next slide. So um, for those working in global surgery, you're probably familiar with the Lancet Commission on Global Surgery, which was published in 2015. Uh, but for those of you who are not, uh, this was really a massive work uh, that first outlined the current state of affairs uh, regarding global access to safe and affordable surgery and anesthesia. And then the authors of this study went on to create some goals uh, that they thought would be achievable by the year 2030. Uh, this paper played a major role in the World Health Organization recognizing safe surgery and anesthesia as really integral to uh, an integral part of universal health care. Um, the idea that health is a human right and not just a privilege. Uh, so um, you'll see in the countries in dark red, uh, those are areas where uh, almost 100% of the population does not have access uh, to surgery. And you can see in this map uh, that this problem is most significant in Sub-Saharan Africa and some parts of Asia. Next slide. So um, there were actually five key messages uh, from this paper. I'm not going to go over all of them, um, but they did define the current problem in terms of access to uh, safe surgery and anesthesia, but also in terms of the financial impact uh, for those people who end up needing this service. Um, and uh, the, key, the first key message was that 5 billion people lack access to safe uh, and affordable surgical and anesthesia care. That's about two-thirds of the world's population. Uh, this is really a global injustice um, that we need to start investing in. Um, the authors of this study also laid out the, the targets, which I mentioned, and I'm not going to go over all of them. But if you look at the second one uh, under indicator name, it's specialist surgical workforce density. Um, their target was that 100% of countries um, would have at least 20 surgical anesthesia and obstetric physicians per 100,000 uh, population by 2030. So um, if you divide that into thirds, uh, assuming that six of those uh, should be physician uh, anesthetists, for a country of Burundi, that should come out to about 600 physician anesthesia providers. We currently have six. Uh, I'm one of six. Uh, next slide. So I wanted to have something for the anesthesia provider. Um, obviously, I don't have time to cover every type of anesthesia in depth, but I did want to talk a little bit about the options that are available in most, but probably not all, operating rooms uh, in resource-poor environments. Um, I listed these in increasing order of complexity and increasing risk, um, although it could be argued that there is no difference in risk uh, in the hands of an experienced provider. Um, I would say in my experience, there, there is a, a massive difference in risk uh, between these options for a lot of anesthesia providers working in low and middle income countries. Um, ketamine uh, is probably the most ubiquitous. Um, it is often called the complete anesthetic, and that's because it, it causes anesthesia, hypnosis, analgesia, and amnesia. Uh, it's really an amazing drug. Uh, it's really 
probably the single most important reason why we're able to do as much surgery as we are in low and middle income countries, but it's not risk-free and we'll talk about that. Uh, spinals in the hands of an experienced provider can be a wonderful choice for most surgeries below the umbilicus, um, for example, lower extremity uh, orthotrauma uh, and C-sections. Um, it's actually been pretty clearly demonstrated now that mortality uh, from C-sections under spinal anesthesia is better than under general anesthesia. Um, but spinals are also not without risk. In terms of the last two, peripheral nerve blocks and general endotracheal anesthesia, it took me some time to decide which to put in which position. Um, uh, there are many different types of peripheral nerve blocks, each presenting a different level of difficulty and a different risk profile. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about just a few of these. Uh, and then finally, we'll talk about general endotracheal anesthesia. Next slide. So ketamine, uh, up in the right-hand corner, you see this cute little pug who is apparently high on ketamine. Do ketamine, they said. It'll be fun, they said. I don't, I don't think he's actually having a good time. Uh, and it's interesting, I, I actually, I've treated a lot of patients who, after having received ketamine, have told me never again um, because the psychological disturbances are just so great. Um, but it really is uh, crucial uh, for access, for continuing access uh, to surgery in a lot of low and middle income countries. Um, in 2014, uh, it's also uh, uh, obviously a drug of potential abuse. Uh, in 2014, the UN Commission uh, on Narcotics actually recommended placing a ver very tight restrictions on ketamine um, worldwide. And this would have been catastrophic for patients uh, needing surgery in many parts of the world, as there's a lot of hospitals where ketamine is the only option for anesthesia. Uh, thankfully, the World Health Organization stepped in and recommended against these restrictions, and so it, it remains available uh, in most of these countries. Um, the other interesting thing about ketamine at the bottom under uh, respiratory, this is from uh, an article in 2016 uh, talking about use of ketamine for perioperative analgesia, which is actually becoming more and more popular here in the U.S. using ketamine for this because it does have a unique uh, mechanism of action as a NMDA antagonist. Um, but if you read the first sentence here, it says, at anesthetic doses, ketamine is well known to preserve pharyngeal and laryngeal reflexes, as well as respiratory drive, um, which has made it an agent of choice in situations where maintenance of spontaneous ventilation is desirable. This is another reason why ketamine is so popular um, in low and middle income countries. Uh, because you can give ketamine, and most of the time patients will keep breathing without being intubated or having another uh, advanced airway device in place. However, having said that, um, I have seen many patients uh, stop breathing after receiving ketamine. So while most of the textbooks will say that everyone's going to keep breathing after they receive ketamine, I would say that is certainly not the case, uh, which is why I do believe that all patients receiving any dose of ketamine should be monitored with pulse oximetry. Uh, next slide. So this is ketamine dosing. Um, so under IV dosing at the top, you'll see that I wrote one to two milligrams per kilogram. Uh, that dose is a bit arbitrary. Um, usually at very low doses with ketamine, you're going to start to have some psych psychomimetic effects, followed by increasing sedation, uh, and finally at higher doses, unconsciousness. Uh, so this IV dosing is it really depends on the length and the invasiveness of the surgery. Uh, we sometimes give as little as 0.5 milligrams per kilo, sometimes up to 10 milligrams per kilogram. And obviously with the higher doses, you're going to see a lot more pronounced uh, side effects. Um, it does have a very rapid onset of action. Uh, the duration of action, five to 10 minutes also is a bit arbitrary. It really depends on the dose. And uh, after repeated boluses, we do find that uh, patients remain sedated for quite a long duration. Uh, ketamine can be given IM intramuscularly at a higher dose, five to seven milligrams per kilogram, uh, obviously with a slower onset of action and a longer duration. Uh, I try, if at all possible, not to give IM ketamine, uh, partly because um, it's just not titratable that way. Um, so if you're going to be doing a very short intervention uh, or procedure, that might be reasonable, but for anything else, I think it's really important to have an IV and be able to give ketamine IV. Next slide. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about ketamine side effects. Um, so there are many side effects to ketamine, which anybody using ketamine should probably be familiar with these. Uh, so first of all, it does cut, cause tachycardia and hypertension. It, it increases sympathetic activity. So while most patients can tolerate uh, this for a brief period, uh, there are patients with cardiovascular disease or cerebrovascular disease uh, for whom uh, even a brief period of tachycardia and hypertension could trigger uh, uh, a more serious complication. Uh, it also increases intracranial pressure, uh, so it's not a great choice in uh, patients who have just had a head trauma or with increased ICP. It increases intraocular pressure, uh, so it's uh, while we do use it a lot for uh, eye surgeries, it's not great for patients with glaucoma or uh, eye trauma. Uh, it is a very potent bronchodilator, um, which is usually more of a positive side effect. Uh, in fact, uh, it's actually the recommended induction agent for general anesthesia in patients who are in status asthmaticus uh, because it is the most potent bronchodilator among the induction agents that we have. Uh, and then the last two are hypersecretions, which we're going to talk about a little bit more, and uh, hallucinations. Um, thankfully, these last two can be prevented by pretreatment with other medications. The hallucinations can often be diminished by pretreating with a benzodiazepine, um, like diazepam or midazolam, if you have that drug. Um, and so that's, uh, and then I'm going to talk now a little bit about the, this, this problem with secretions. Next slide. So the question often presents itself, if I'm giving ketamine to a patient, should I be pre-treating them with something to dry their secretions? So you can give an anticholinergic uh, to decrease the secretions, uh, and that would usually be atropine, or if your hospital has it available, glycopyrrolate. Those both are very good uh, agents for drying secretions. Um, so then the question is, well, are these secretions dangerous? Uh, in my experience, um, I would say that they can be very dangerous. Um, a patient with a lot of secretions can have airway obstruction, uh, but also if uh, they are uh, deeply sedated or anesthetized, a drop of those secretions falling back and touching the vocal cords can, 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 um, can trigger laryngospasm and complete airway obstruction. And I have seen that happen uh, not infrequently. So this was a study uh, in 2006 where they actually uh, did a double-blinded randomized study uh, in kids between one and 16 years getting IM ketamine. Uh, and they divided them into those being pre-treated with atropine and those being pre-treated with a placebo. Next slide. And so um, they found that uh, the hypersalivation actually was uh, diminished in a, was statistically significantly diminished uh, but for those patients who pre-received atropine. Um, but they actually did not find uh, a, a statistically significant difference in strider and laryngospasm. Uh, this was not a huge study, and I suspect that if they had enrolled more patients, they probably would have uh, seen a difference and a higher incidence of strider and laryngospasm in those patients who were not pretreated with atropine. Next slide. So this is the technique that I use. Um, if I'm anticipating using more than two milligrams per kilogram of ketamine, I try to pretreat all these patients um, with diazepam to prevent the hallucinations and the other bizarre uh, psychotropic effects of ketamine. Um, and I also pretreat with atropine, uh, 0.02 milligrams per kilogram. I try to get both of these medicines in two to three minutes before I start giving ketamine uh, because the data really suggests that you're going to be a lot more successful in preventing these side effects if you can get these medicines in a couple minutes in before you start giving ketamine. And I really insist on always monitoring these patients with pulse oximetry uh, because, as I've said, uh, we do see respiratory uh, depression, respiratory complications with ketamine. And I try to always have oxygen and ventilation equipment available, at least an Ambu bag with an appropriately sized mask. Next slide. So spinal anesthesia. Uh, is another great anesthetic. Um, it's cheap, it's fairly easy, um, but the question presents itself, how many spinals does a trainee have to do uh, before they've mastered the procedure? So this question really has three parts. Um, the first one is just being able to get the tip of the needle into the subarachnoid space. Uh, 
um, safely and using sterile technique, I would add. Uh, the, but once you've mastered this, you also need to know what dose of local anesthetic to use. Um, we use bupivacaine uh, almost routinely uh, at Kibuye. And I would say one size, in terms of dosing, one size fits all, fits most, but not all. Um, there certainly are patients who are, you're going to need to adjust the dose. Uh, and the, the third part of this question is being able to understand the complications of spinal anesthesia, um, how to prevent uh, and monitor for and treat these complications. So this was a study uh, done by actually my mentors at Virginia Mason Hospital in Seattle, looking at the regional anesthesia learning curve. Uh, and their question was, what is the minimum number of epidural and spinal blocks needed to reach consistency? And so they were looking at first year residents and uh, their conclusion was that in order to get a 90% success rate, uh, these first year residents had to do at least 45 uh, spinals and at least 60 epidurals. We don't do epidural anesthesia uh, at Kibuye. It takes a lot more equipment and a lot more monitoring postoperatively. Um, but for our trainees, especially our anesthetist students, I think this gives them a goal uh, to shoot for um, to, to before they've really mastered at least the technique of accessing the subarachnoid space. Next slide. So um, there are risks of spinal anesthesia. Um, and uh, even if you know how to do the procedure, you have to be familiar with the complications and how to prevent these. So uh, the most common complication is hypotension. Um, the bupivacaine in the subarachnoid space will block motor and sensory nerves, but it also blocks sympathetic nerves, which control uh, vasoconstriction. And so blocking those will cause the patient to be vasodilated. Uh, and so almost all patients uh, de get a, have a decreased blood pressure after spinal anesthesia. Uh, this can be prevented uh, somewhat, but not eliminated by pre-volume loading these patients with 10 to 20 milliliters per kilogram of normal saline. And then also obviously close monitoring um, after the spinal is put in. Uh, bradycardia and cardiac arrest are also possible. Uh, especially if the spinal goes up to a level of above T5. Uh, between the dermatome levels of T1 to T5 are the cardioaccelerator fibers, which work in opposition to the vagal nerve. Uh, and so obviously if you block those, you have unopposed vagal stimulation, um, and that's gonna put people at risk for bradycardia and possibly cardiac arrest. Uh, high spinal and to total spinal, um, can, the risk of this can be diminished knowing appropriate dosing um, but not eliminated. And I'm going to talk in a minute about why that is. Um, nerve root damage and spinal cord damage, thankfully, are very rare, especially if you're only doing spinals in awake patients um, who, if as soon as the tip of your needle even comes close to a nerve, they're going to scream and probably run out the door and maybe hit you in the face before they do. Um, epidural hematoma uh, is also a possible complication, which can be the risk of which can be diminished uh, by not doing this in coagulopathic patients. Um, so uh, if the patient does have uh, a complete blood cell count beforehand, it's good to check the platelet levels. Um, my rule is in terms of platelet levels, I will never do a spinal if the platelets are less than 80,000. I will almost always do a spinal if the platelets are greater than 100,000. And between 80 and 100, uh, I'm really gonna have to weigh the, the risks and the benefits uh, for that particular patient and for that particular surgery. Uh, meningitis and epidural abscess are, you know, obviously infectious complications um, and which you can avoid by doing this under sterile technique and also by not doing spinals in septic patients or patients with infections where you're going to be doing the, the puncture. Uh, and postural puncture headache, I'll talk a little bit about more about that in a second. Uh, the risk of that can be diminished by using the smallest possible spinal needle and by using Whitaker needles, which are pencil point needles. And finally, another risk is failure. Uh, we do see spinal anesthetics fail. I like to remind uh, my colleagues and especially my surgical colleagues that failure is not always the fault of the person doing the spinal. Um, while it is possible that they did not place the medication in the correct location, um, there actually are patient related reasons why a spinal might fail and there are medication related um, reasons why the uh, spinal might fail. Next slide. So these are the contraindications to spinal anesthesia. And uh, I'm not gonna go over all of them, but I just wanna mention uh, 
uh, under absolute contraindications, severe hypovolemia, and you'll see severe aortic stenosis and severe mitral stenosis. Um, it is important to not do spinal anesthesia in patients who are volume depleted um, because that will drop their blood pressure uh, and patients with advanced stenotic valvular uh, heart disease uh, usually cannot compensate for that state of vasodilation by augmenting uh, their ejection uh, volume. Uh, next slide. So often uh, surgeons have asked me in the past, uh, how long will this spinal last? And my answer uh, is uh, usually I have no idea and they don't, they don't like that answer so much. Um, but uh, the reason is because there is a lot of patient variability um, even using the same dose. If I give the same dose of bupivacaine to 10 different patients, I'm gonna get a different block height and a different length of block for each patient. Um, so you'll see, if you look at under bupivacaine on the far right, the duration, if you add epinephrine or adrenaline, is 100 to 150 minutes. So that is a very wide range of almost an hour uh, in terms of interpatient variability. Uh, and I'm gonna mention why that is. Next slide. Uh, and so this is the reason for that variability. Um, when you look at the factors that determine block height and block duration after spinal anesthesia, most of the textbooks, um, they'll give a long list of things in terms of the volume, uh, the age of the patient, the baricity the, or the density of that local anesthetic. But one thing a lot of them don't mention is this. Uh, this was a really interesting article in 1998 in anesthesiology where the authors actually quantified uh, the volume of cerebrospinal fluid in uh, patients undergoing spinal anesthesia and correlated that with the block height and the duration of spinal anesthesia. And they found that this was the single most important determinant of block height and block duration. Uh, and there were certain patients that actually had a very large volume of CSF in their lumbosacral region. These patients tend to be resistant to spinal anesthesia. This can be one of those reasons why spinal might fail uh, because of a patient-related factor. There are other patients who have a much smaller volume, and these are the patients that can suffer a, a high spinal or a total spinal, even with a normal dose of bupivacaine. Um, and unfortunately, there is not a good way to predict this externally um, based on the patient's height or size, um, unless you're gonna be doing MRIs on all your patients beforehand. Uh, so this is something to keep in mind. Um, next slide. Uh, in terms of post-dural post puncture headache, this is a very common complication after spinal anesthesia or even lumbar puncture. Um, the prevalence of this really depends on the type of needle you're using and the size of the needle. Um, so if you're using a very small pencil point needle like a 25 or 27 gauge Whitaker, you can see the frequency is between one to 2%, pretty low. Um, we unfortunately in Burundi have not been able to, to to find Whitaker needles. So we, we use Quinky needles and we use the smallest gauge we can purchase, which is a 25 gauge. Um, in this uh, study, which is um, was actually uh, taken out of Chestnut's uh, book on obstetric anesthesia, uh, they listed the frequency of post puncture headache with a 25 gauge Quinky at 6%. Um, we recently uh, looked at the data after C-section for our patients at Kabuye and found that our incidence was actually closer to 10%. Interestingly, um, it did not affect the duration of hospitalization for these women. Um, and I don't really have a good explanation for why that is. For most patients who have this complication, they have a very debil debilitating headache um, that is severe in the sitting position or standing and is minimal or even disappears completely when they're lying flat. Um, and uh, Usually this resolves spontaneously within one to two weeks, but it can uh, cause longer, uh, a, a problem with a longer duration. Next slide. So the other, another question that often presents itself is, can we do spinals in kids? And the answer is yes, we can, but it is risky. Um, it's risky for uh, really two main reasons. First of all, if you're talking about newborns or really small kids, the, the spinal cord in adults ends at a level of about L1. Uh, in newborns, it, it ends at about L3. So you really have to make sure that you're doing this, uh, the spinal at a lower level, at least below L3, and you have to be confident in, in your landmarks. Um, but the, probably the bigger problem is that um, kids often are not cooperative. Uh, it's hard to convince a child to 
lay still while you poke a needle in their back. Um, uh, so uh, our technique, uh, and you also do have to calculate the dose based on their weight. So we, when we do spinals in kids, we use 0.3 milligrams per kilogram. Uh, in my experience, I say if they're over 14 years, we can usually do this. If they're under 10, it rarely works. And if they're between 10 and 14, it really depends on, on the child. Next slide. Uh, and so general anesthesia. Um, obviously, this is more complicated, more expensive. You really need compressed oxygen to run the ventilator on the anesthesia machine. You need continuous electricity. Uh, and you also really need someone know who knows how to intubate and how to evaluate when things go wrong. Uh, this picture up on the upper right-hand corner is an example of one of the dozens of things that can go wrong during general anesthesia. We do a lot of surgery on neonates and infants at Kabuye, um, and for this, we're often using endotracheal tubes that are very small and very fragile um, and that kink very easily, um, especially when the, the surgeon puts the drapes up. Uh, and so, uh, an experienced anesthetist will recognize this immediately based on the CO2 waveform, based on an increase in peak inspiratory pressures. But a less experienced anesthesia provider might not recognize this until the child starts desaturating. And kids don't give you a lot of time uh, being desaturated before they go into cardiac arrest. Um, so there's a ton of complications that we could talk about. Similar to this, we don't have time to. Uh, I will say that most of the studies I've looked at in Sub-Saharan Africa do show an increased mortality with general anesthesia compared to other types of anesthesia. However, it is difficult to assess because, as you can imagine, the patients needing general endotracheal anesthesia are often sicker. They're often requiring bigger interventions. Uh, but I do think that uh, in our context, there is a higher rate of complications and especially post-operative complications, respiratory complications in particular. Next slide. And finally, peripheral nerve blocks. Um, so I would say in general, they probably do present a lower risk than general anesthesia, but it's not risk-free. Um, you can accidentally put the local anesthetic into a blood vessel, which can cause local anesthetic toxicity. Um, you can damage nerves uh, for a lot of the brachial plexus blocks. You can uh, cause a pneumothorax. Uh, I would say there's a higher rate of failure. One of my attendings in residency used to say, if a, you do a peripheral nerve block and it fails, it's your fault. If you do a general anesthesia and it fails, the patient did not take well to the anesthetic. Uh, so I don't know if that's true or not. But um, anyway, in our context, I found this most useful for upper extremity surgery, uh, in particular brachial plexus blocks. Um, but I think it is really important to have ultrasound available for these, uh, for these blocks. Next slide. So there's four approaches to the brachial plexus. Uh, the highest is the interscalene block, uh, which is done in the neck at the level of the cricoid cartilage. Um, the next lowest is the supraclavicular block, which I've demonstrated here. Um, a little bit lower is the infraclavicular block, and finally the axillary block, which uh, poses probably the fewest risks, but I would say also a higher rate of failure because the nerves tend to be uh, a little bit distant one from another. And so you really have to be able to target every nerve individually. Um, I've become quite enamored with the supraclavicular block since uh, I started working at Kabuye. One of my attendings in residence used to call this the spinal anesthesia of the arm. Um, and that's because it really does give very reliable, a good reliable block to, uh, to the arm. Um, it's not the best block for shoulder surgery. Um, and sometimes you can get nerve sparing. Uh, because of that uh, for shoulder surgery, but anything below the level of the, sh the shoulder, it's a great block for. Um, and you can see on ultrasound, SA is the subclavian artery. And just lateral to the left of that is all the nerves of the brachial plexus. They're all in one big, delicious, juicy packet, just waiting for you to deposit local anesthetic around them. Um, it's almost like they just, they just want to be blocked. Uh, However, uh, and, and I think that's why this block um, is so reliable, and it is something that I've started teaching our uh, Burundian anesthetists how to do. But if you look in the picture just below uh, those nerves, it lies the first rib and the pleura. And so there is a risk of pneumothorax when this is done uh, in the hands of somebody who's not uh, under appropriate supervision or who's not um, well experienced in this technique. Next slide. <clears throat> 
Okay, so I wanted to move on and just give a little something for the person who works with anesthesia providers. Um, this would be surgeons or people doing other interventions. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the importance of knowing who you're working with, uh, the importance of creativity in our context, and a little bit about the potential for drug errors. Next slide. So um, if you go on the World Federation Society of Anesthesiologists website, they have a really cool interactive map and you can click on any country and you can see the population, the number of physicians, number of surgeons, and then you can see the number of physician anesthesia providers. So I've clicked on Burundi here. You can see that we have six physician anesthesia providers. If you go below that, you see nurse anesthesia providers and there you see nothing. Uh, and that is because we do not have a nurse anesthesia training model, which is the model used in the United States. So these are usually people with a nursing degree who then go on and work in critical care for a year or two, and then go back and get a master's degree as a nurse anesthetist. This is the model that they use in Kenya. Um, but if you go one step lower, other anesthesia providers, we do have 328. So we have what are called anesthesia technicians. Uh, so they go to a university, they do classroom work for three years, and then they do six months of clinical rotations. So um, a lot of these uh, anesth anesthesia technicians um, usually graduate having done between five and 10 intubations. Uh, so, you know, the, it's, I would say they're not totally yet prepared to do general anesthesia. Um, they've usually done uh, an adequate number of spinals and certainly given plenty of ketamine. Um, and, you know, the, the anesthetists that return and work with us obviously do get uh, more and more experience with general anesthesia. And our anesthetists are very comfortable doing that now. Um, but it's important for the person working with the anesthesia provider to have an idea of what they're comfortable with, what their anesthesia provider is comfortable with, and to try to not push uh, anesthetists to do types of anesthesia that they're not comfortable with. It's interesting to note that in Burundi before 2004, there was actually no anesthesia uh, training program. So all anesthetists were nurses or pharmacists or community health workers who were just basically shown on the job how to give ketamine and maybe how to do spinals. And I suspect that that practice still continues in a lot of very rural parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, unfortunately. Next slide. So in terms of creativity, I am not a creative person. I am not resourceful. I do not know how to fix anything, but uh, thankfully God has placed me on a team with very creative and resourceful people who know how to fix all the things that I break. Um, and so one problem that's really common under all types of anesthesia, especially general anesthesia, is hypothermia. Patients drop their temperature under anesthesia because of the subsequent vasodilation. Uh, and so, you know, in the US, we have these forced bear huggers. We have dozens of ways to keep patients warm uh, during surgery and anesthesia, um, which we didn't have in Burundi. So uh, thankfully, we have an engineer on our team who took an old broken down refrigerator and put some incandescent light bulbs in it. And then he mounted this temperature probe, which was actually uh, created for snake cages. Uh, and so we can actually control the temperature in this refrigerator and we put fluids and we put robes in there. Uh, and it's been just one step in terms of the, the, something small we can do to try to prevent hypothermia in our context. Next slide. Uh, on the left-hand side, in terms of creativity, you'll see me doing a fiber optic intubation uh, for a woman with a big mandibular tumor. Uh, we don't actually have a fiber optic scope, but we do have a cystoscope. And so uh, I found that you can put a 7.0 tube over this cystoscope, and I've been able to do a couple fiber optic intubations with that. It's not ideal, but uh, it works. We do wash it between patients. Um, on the right-hand side, uh, if you're not familiar with Lifebox, uh, if you're working in a low or middle income country and you're doing surgery and anesthesia without pulse oximetry, I highly encourage you to contact Lifebox. Um, they're an NGO uh, based in the UK. It was actually started by Atul Gawande. Uh, and their goal, their mission uh, was to put a pulse oximeter in every operating room all over the world. So uh, when we first uh, started doing anesthesia at Kabuye, we got some donated pulse oximeters. Since then we've bought uh, dozens and we actually one of our surgeons uh, mounted them onto the, the beds in our critical care beds and on our surgery ward. Um, 
so that they're always there and they don't wander off anymore. Next slide. So um, as your surgical volume increases, uh, two things that you're really going to need uh, are oxygen and electricity. So um, we, a few years ago, we purchased this industrial grade oxygen concentrator. Uh, in the middle, you'll see Samaritan Purse's own David Buckland, who uh, actually flew to Burundi to help us install this. Uh, and this actually provided us with continuous uh, compressed oxygen in our operating rooms. And we also had it piped into our uh, neonatal ICU. And so we thought this was going to be the answer to all of our oxygen problems. This is great. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, um, at night, when the electricity would go off, it would flip one of the breakers in this machine and the oxygen would stop. Uh, and so next slide. So we had to invest in electricity. And so we invested in a huge solar project, um, which uh, took over a month to install. We had a team come out to install this uh, incredibly uh, effective uh, solar project. And this has now supplied uh, electricity to our hospital 24 seven. And our oxygen concentrator has worked flawlessly ever since. Next slide. And then I want to talk a little bit about the potential for drug errors, drug swap. This is a topic that uh, we talk about in the US. I would say uh, the risk of this problem is significantly higher uh, in low resource settings. Uh, I give, give, I've given you a few examples in photos in the middle, you see six different medications, which all look remarkably similar. Uh, and on the, on the right, three more, which also look very similar. On the left, uh, that's a vial of oxytocin. Um, you might think that because of the way I took the picture, you can't read the label. No, in fact, the label is just not really able to be read. Uh, I thought maybe I was going blind for a while, but the writing is so faint, uh, it is really hard to read what, what this contains. And so obviously, that's going to... Uh, put us at risk of uh, accidentally giving a vial of adrenaline when we meant to give a vial of gentamicin or another complication like that. Next slide. Uh, also, uh, on the left, you'll see two vials of cloxicillin, which I found in the same drawer on the same day. Um, the one on the left is one gram. The one on the right is 500 milligrams. Uh, because of the, uh, our purchasing uh, methods and what we're able to purchase in country, we often get uh, our medications from different distributors that changes from month to month. Uh, and so this is another uh, problem that we have to be aware of. This is falls under the category of pitfalls to which I have not yet found a pearl. Uh, we do our best to try to keep our medicines well organized, um, but I'm still uh, searching for a way to minimize the risk of uh, drug errors. Next slide. And then a couple more potential problems on the left. This is fun. This happens to me about every other day. I'm trying to open a vial of gentamicin and it just breaks in my hand. And I think I've probably absorbed super therapeutic levels of gentamicin since I've started working at Kabuye from all the cuts on my hand. Uh, my Brindian colleagues don't seem to have this problem. I'm not sure what I'm doing wrong. Uh, but anyway, uh, this, is, uh, this is one problem. On the right uh, is another interesting uh, scenario. Uh, one of our colleagues brought me this vial of propofol and asked if I thought it might have expired. I wonder if anybody in the audience sees any problem with this picture. Uh, so propofol is white. It looks like milk. So this is clearly not propofol. Um, and so I don't know where the propofol went or why it went. Uh, but yeah, this is, uh, if this happened, obviously this was very evident in a vial of propofol. It's going to be less evident with certain other medications, which are usually clear. Next slide. Uh, and finally, I want to talk about something for the person who has nothing to do with anesthesia, and I want to talk about pain management. Next slide. So uh, unfortunately, pain in uh, low and middle income countries is a problem which is often neglected. Um, it's uh, obviously um, there are People don't typically die for lack of analgesia, uh, but I do believe it affects outcomes. And so unfortunately, it usually takes a backseat to more important things like fluids and antibiotics. Um, this group, this International Association for the Study of Pain, talked about uh, what was called the treatment gap, which is the gap between what uh, should be done to treat people's pain and what can be done. And they went, in, went on to outline several barriers uh, including just lack of education, government policies, fear of opioid addiction, uh, 
the, the cost for these medications uh, and patient compliance. Um, and so next slide. So thankfully in December, uh, Dr. Wayne Morris, uh, who's uh, from New Zealand, an anesthesiologist from New Zealand, uh, brought a team to Burundi to do what's called the Essential Pain Management Workshop. And it was a one day workshop, um, basically giving some tools to healthcare providers, uh, not just anesthetists, but surgeons, nurses, pharmacists. Um, and two of our anesthetists went to this workshop and then came back to Kabuye and uh, held uh, the same workshop for about 15 of our hospital employees. Um, next slide. And so the goal of this workshop was really to just give people some very straightforward, useful tools. Uh, and the first thing they talk about is the RAT system, the importance of first recognizing pain, which basically means asking patients if they're having pain, then assessing pain, giving them a tool how to assess pain, and finally uh, giving them some training and treatment options for pain. Next slide. So this is the, uh, the visual analog scale that is used in uh, most of the world uh, in terms of quantifying people's pain on a scale of zero to 10 um, with the faces for uh, children or people who can't quite understand the scale. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if we could find a way to actually start measuring people's pain at Kibuye? Um, but obviously this was in English. Next slide. Uh, and in December, I went to a conference and there was an anesthesiologist there from Rwanda who presented the exact same uh, VAS card, but in Kenya, Rwanda. And Kenya, Rwanda and Karundi are very similar. And I asked him if I could have a copy of that. He uh, sent it to me. I laminated it. And uh, following in the advice of Atul Gawande in his book, Better, I decided to start measuring something. So I enlisted the help of two of our med students who for two months went around and just asked patients, post-operative patients, uh, on their first through their third post-operative day, their pain score. And we found that patients, the vast majority of patients actually were able to understand the scale and to give us um, a score. Um, and then after two months of that, um, this was about the time that we had this workshop, uh, we started doing pain rounds every day. Um, and I would take this card around with a group of medical students and we would follow all of our patients post-operatively. And next, next slide. Um, in terms of treatment, um, we use the World Health Organization analgesic ladder, which is uh, really simple uh, to use. And thankfully, we do have at least one medication in each of these three categories. So for patients with mild pain, we prescribe them uh, Tylenol, paracetamol. For patients with moderate pain, we would give them Tylenol plus tramadol. And for patients with severe pain, we would give them Tylenol, Tramadol, and morphine. Uh, next slide. And so on the right, you'll see a couple of our medical students uh, going around showing this to our patients, getting pain scores. We have a pain register now where we record every patient's pain score and the plan of action uh, during that day. And so after two more months of uh, follow-up, we actually looked at the data and found that we did get lower pain scores, uh, and we actually got significantly a uh, shorter time to first ambulation when we implemented these basic uh, steps, uh, daily pain rounds, some education for the staff, um, and uh, implementation of the World Health Organization analgesic ladder. Um, and so, and for most types of surgery, we were able to improve or decrease time to ambulation between eight to 16 hours. Um, so uh, I think it was a really positive effect. I, I pasted uh, a couple uh, useful tools at the front of our pain register. On the left-hand side, at the upper left-hand side, I actually had a medical student write out the dialogue for how he explains each of the 10 levels uh, of this pain score in Karundi. And so there's been a few days when I didn't have a med student, and I uh, went around and did this myself, and I got a lot of laughs, uh, but most of the patients uh, were able to give me a pain uh, score on that 0 to 10 scale. Um, and then on the upper right-hand side, you'll, you'll see I've pasted a very simple algorithm for how to give morphine safely um, in terms of how much time you need to monitor, dosing. Um, and so, and then on the bottom left-hand side, some other analgesics that we use, the appropriate doses. Um, and this is to help me and the, the rest of my team uh, continue to do these pain rounds. Um, and so... Um, a question, obviously, is how, how do you engage uh, people who are not accustomed to paying attention to pain scores, to treating pain, how, how do you 
how do you motivate them to do this? Um, we do work with a Christian university. And uh, as I'm lecturing about this subject to our anesthetist students and our medical students, um, I like to share a little bit of scripture. Uh, it's from Matthew 25. Uh, and I'm almost done here, but I do want to read this. In Matthew chapter 25, verses 35 to 40, uh, he says, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. I had an intermedullary nail put in my femur, and you gave me morphine. Then the righteous will answer him. And then, obviously, he says, when did the disciples say, when did we see you doing these things? And he answers, truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Um, and obviously, it doesn't say anything about intermedullary nail in there. I know that. But these are, I believe, all examples of suffering. Um, and so I, I try to explain that pain is a form of suffering and that we do, uh, as followers of Christ, need to respond uh, to that need. And, and we have the tools and we have the capacity to do it. Um, and so that's kind of been one of my approaches. So next slide. So finally, I just want to say thank you very much. Uh, if I have had any level of success in what I've done in Burundi, it is only because God has placed me amongst this incredible team of really remarkably uh, gifted, intelligent, and compassionate people. Uh, and for that, I am truly grateful. Uh, and that is the end. We can next slide is my references. Fantastic. Uh, Dr. Sean, thank you so much uh, for a great presentation. Uh, even this uh, internist uh, could follow most of that. So uh, you did a great job. Next time I need intubation with a cystoscope, I know where to go. Um, <laughs> uh, remarkable hospital. Um, Kabuye, as I said, I was able to visit there um, several times uh, in the last six months, and um, they're just doing remarkable work. Um, to our listening audience out there, um, uh, please uh, utilize uh, your chat box at this time to pose questions uh, to, to Greg. Um, I am no anesthesiologist, so um, there's very few intelligent questions that I can uh, pose to him at this time, but uh, 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 please, if you have questions, um, you ask us that. I'm not, I'm not sure that I see any right now. A um, couple things. I, uh, I really, I had, uh, Greg, I can ask you one question that I did have. Um, with uh, spinals, um, I have seen regular bupivacaine and heavy mm. bupivacaine. Yeah. Is there any real clinical benefit to utilizing maybe heavy bupivacaine over regular? And maybe you can just elaborate about that a little bit. Yeah, so the big difference between those two is um, if you're using uh, heavy bupivacaine or hyperbaric, the density is, is more than the density of the CSF. So the, level of, the height of the block is really going to depend on the position of the patient after you place it. If you put it in a sitting patient and you leave that sitting, uh, it's going to sink and probably their toes will get numb, uh, which might not be ideal if you want to do a C-section. Uh, if you're using isobaric or uh, normal bupivacaine, uh, but it's actually not a factor in determining the block height. Uh, so it's usually going to spread upwards and downwards uh, despite the position of the patient. Um, I think you can get the same level of block uh, uh, with either one. You just have to be aware of the effects of position if you're using heavier upper bear bupivacaine. Great. Okay, very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, still don't see any questions, Greg. Um, I guess the only other comment I just make is um, uh, during his, uh, your presentation, um, just staggering numbers about the deficiency of uh, healthcare providers and specifically uh, anesthesiologists um, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And just having seen what I uh, saw in um, at Kabuye Hospital, they're really just a real light in a dark world. Um, it's awesome. Not only are they pro providing excellent clinical care that's otherwise not available in Burundi, but they're really teaching the next generation of nationals there to provide uh, anesthesia and um, surgical care, um, all for the sake of the gospel. So that's very, very exciting uh, for us to see. Um, a lot of the um, the staff uh, at Kabuye um, are graduates of our post residency program. Um, which has really been designed to revitalize mission hospitals. Um, so um, it's just remarkable to see the miracles that God are, is performing there. So 
Um, Greg, thank you so much. And uh, really, uh, you did, again, a remarkable job. There's no questions. You've answered everything. Um, just want to um, remind everybody um, that uh, there is CME credit always available um, for this session. The form and instructions uh, will be in uh, an email that we'll be sending a follow up uh, with a, a link to this recording. Um, if you uh, are not already on our email list, you can join the forum at health.samaritansfirst.org um, and um, learn about upcoming events. Just want to remind everybody about Prescription for Renewal, uh, which is our annual uh, medical conference uh, through Samaritans First. It will be in Orlando, September 19th through the 22nd. If you are in the post-residency program or a, a former uh, have gone through the post-residency program or you're a full-time missionary, there uh, is um, scholarships available. Uh, also, if you're in uh, DART, uh, there's um, uh, um, some scholarships available too. So just encourage you guys uh, to attend PFR. Um, Mike Huckabee, um, Nikki Haley, Kent Brantley, a lot of remarkable people will be speaking to us and it's just gonna be an incredible time of fellowship and um, opportunity to network with the medical sector at Samaritans First. Uh, please join us uh, next uh, month, Wednesday, uh, July the 10th. Dr. Bruce Dahman will be speaking about uh, CAPS, um, which is really uh, sort of a cousin uh, or a sister organization to PACS, Pan-African Academy of Christian Surgeons. CAPS is a new organization. It's Christian Association of African Physicians. It's sort of the medical equivalent to the surgical um, organization of PACS. Um, it's basically just really um, creating the next generation of medical physicians in Africa. And uh, you won't want to miss Dr. Dahlman. So with that, thank you so much for joining us. God bless and have a great day.